I'm Michael Carter. I am the chairman of the Josh Longley Sports Commission, and I'll be your MC for tonight's festivities. I want to thank everyone for, for attending the Josh Longley Sports Hall of Fame Class of 2014. Every year we have much to celebrate. Tonight, I'd like to recognize a few special guests. From the Onslow County Board of Education, Chairman Pam Thomas, Earl Taylor, and Brock Ridge. From the Jacksonville City Council, Robert Warden. Onslow County Commissioners, the Chairman Paul Buchanan. The Mayor of Richlands, McKinley Smith. Sergeant Major Paul Berry, MCI East, Marine Corps Base, Camp Lejeune. <laughs> Colonel James W. Clark, Deputy Commander, MCI East, Camp Lejeune. <laughs> Thank you all for attending. I'd also like to ta take a moment at this time to introduce the Jasla Onslow Sports Commission and their board members, Vice Chairman Carol McIntyre, Kim Oliver, Bob Kellum, John Kopka, Mike Tootin, and a few of our members couldn't be here tonight. That's Michael Lazara, Greg Cooper, Steve Goodson, G.T. Johnson, and Davidson Myers. We'd like to thank Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune for allowing us to host our event this evening here at Paradise Point Officers Club. We'd also like to thank Jones Onslow EMC, Hunter Development, Platinum Corral, and National Dodge for their donations and support for making tonight's event a success. We also want to thank Chick-fil-A, Hampton Inn and Suites of Jacksonville, Chili's Grill and Bar, Olive Garden, Honey Baked Hams and Cafe, Logan's Roadhouse, Showguns, and Carolina L House for putting together our special bags for our Heisman winners. Now please welcome Jess Lonslow's Commission, Sports Commission's Executive Director, Ashley Backer. Thank you, Mike. Thank you all for being, up, being with us this evening as we celebrate those that have helped pave the way for sports in Onslow County, those who show the state and the nation that we can compete at the highest level, and finally, those who take advantage of the resources given to them so that they can be leaders among their peers, both on and off their field of play. My name is Ashley Backer. I'm the Executive Director of the Jacksonville Onslow Sports Commission. Our mission continues to be the economic growth and development, as well as the increased quality of play for those residents of Onslow County, North Carolina. I'm proud to say that we fulfill our mission every day. Between events being hosted by local community members and events being brought in from outside of Onslow County, we saw a 17% increase in economic growth from 2012 to 2013. The 2013 fiscal year is tracking to have sports tourism producing over $2 million worth of visitor spending in Onslow County. Our local teams and athletes are also competing at their highest level, which you will see with our special recognitions later in the program. Most importantly for our organization, though, is the increased interest by organizations to host their events in Onslow County. During the 2013-14 fiscal year, we will see or have seen at least 15 new events in our community. These are 15 more opportunities to increase visitor spending, 15 more ways to showcase our community as a destination for future events, 15 more events for our community members to participate in, and 15 more competitions that bring in outside talent to, talent to compete against our very best. Even more pleasing, and really what makes me excited every single day, are the phone calls and discussions I have with larger events. We are on the map and we are a viable destination. It, it is our proximity to the beach, great venues, and abundance of quality hotels and restaurants that get our foot in the door. However, it's our volunteer base, 
our community support in wanting new events, and local government's commitment to making it easy to host an event in our area that puts us over the top. While there is always work to be done, we are a sporting destination that you should all be proud of. I want to thank you all for your support of what we do, for either being a part of this process of allowing us to be competitive, or being one of the athletes showing how competitive we are daily. I hope you all enjoy the program. Thank you, Ashley. At this time, I'd like to present or introduce our first presenter. She has been with the Onza County School System for quite some time as a teacher and now as a member of the Board of Education. Through her success and her board's success, the public school system continues to thrive, especially during these hard economic times. It is my pleasure to introduce Pam Thomas to come forward to recognize our Wendy Heisman School winners. Thank you, Mike. I'm glad you didn't say how old I was. But I did notice that he said Lejeune instead of Lejeune. And that's what I probably will say tonight as I talk about this base and the athletes that will be recognized from here. It really is a pleasure to introduce these very talented athletes. As a former athlete and coach, I recognize and really appreciate all of the hard work and the dedication these students have made, not just in their field of play, but in the academic arena as well. Now, before I talk about the criteria for the Wendy's Heisman High School scholarship winners, I want to tell you to all of the parents a big thank you from the Onslow County Board of Education, from the Sports Commission, and for your community, not only for the support you give your students, but the encouragement that you give them for being there when they need you and helping them realize their dreams. The investment that you've made in your students today are going to pay big dividends in their future and in the future profession they enter and wherever they reside, they will be beneficial adults. So I thank you for that. In fact, I think we ought to give all of the parents and those supporters a big hand of applause because it is to you we honor you. Now, the criteria to apply for the Wendy Heisman Scholarship is pretty tough. It's based on the ACT or SAT scores. Your GPA is one of the qualifications to be considered. The level of courses that one takes. Academic honors, athletic events and activities, honors, involvement in other extracurricular uh, uh, programs, employment, volunteer participation, as well as community involvement. How in the world do they have time to play a sport and to do all of those things? I don't know, but they do it well. In simple terms, this scholarship really does honor the complete student athlete. And as you will hear about some of their accomplishments this evening, you will be surprised that they still are at the top of their game academically and they are excelling in other ways as well. Our current Heisman winners have an average GPA of 4.28. They volunteered with over 30 different organizations. They've compiled seven all-county honors, 16 all-conference honors, and three all-area honors. We also have two state championships and one all-state award winner. And these young men and women are leaders on and off their field of play, and we are incredibly proud of them, and we wish them well as they continue on their educational track after graduation this year. Our first school winner comes from Jacksonville High School. Alexis Hurd competes in tennis, soccer, and basketball. Alexis has a grade point average of 4.55 and is a regular volunteer at the soup kitchen. She will be attending UNC Pembroke on a scholarship, uh, soccer and an academic scholarship. She will also major in criminal justice and psychology. Her parents are Tariq and Pensa Hurd. Are they to come forward at this time? Thank you. <laughs> you 
David Thacker is also from Jacksonville High School where he excels in lacrosse. He will be attending East Carolina University in the fall, will major in physical therapy. He is the son of David and Sherry Thacker, and I hope that he's with us this evening. Is he? Okay, well, we still honor him, and we will congratulate him when we see him later. From Camp Lejeune High School, we have Jamaz Richardson, who competes in three sports, track, basketball, and football. A few of his, award, his awards include being named to all conference, all area, and all state teams. Jamaz volunteers at Hunters Creek Middle School. His postgraduate plans are to study business while pursuing a football career. His parents are James and Jackie Richardson. Also, also for, from uh, Lejeune is Alexis Cruz, who is involved in cheerleading and softball. A few of her awards are Most Improved, a Sportsmanship Award, and an MVP in softball. She will also attend East Carolina in the fall, and her parents are Albert and Michelle Cruz. Joby Armenta is a wrestler from Southwest High School. He volunteers with the Southwest Summer Day Camps, and he also works with local youth wrestlers at a wrestling club. He will attend a university where he will work on a degree in biology, which will prepare him for entry into medical school. His parents are Job and Jody Armenta, and they are here to accept this award on his behalf because he's on his senior trip. Courtney Whaley also is on her senior trip and is from Southwest High School. She competes in soccer. And she volunteers with the Onslow County Parks and Recreation Summer Camps, Onslow Classic Soccer Association, and Christmas Cheer. She, pl she plans to attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where she will pursue a doctorate degree in physical therapy. And her parents are not here with us this evening. They plan to be but her parents are Alan and Sandra Whaley. Let's give them a hand. <laughs> Ryan Minervini, and please forgive me if I mispronounce that, is a football athlete from Dixon High School. He is unable to be with us this evening due to his senior prom. He's been the team captain and he carries a 4.2 GPA. He plans to attend Campbell University this fall and major in biology, and his future plans beyond that is to go to medical school and be an Air Force surgeon. His parents are Paul and Christine Minervini. <laughs> Nicholas Hall is from White Oak High School. He competes in swimming, soccer, and track. He's earned countless awards in all three of these sports and has a GPA 4.71. He will be attending a university where he will major in pro-medical uh, pro uh, engineering, biomedical engineering, with a goal of working with medical professionals and finding treatments for illnesses and cures for difficult uh, to treat illnesses. His parents are Robert and Megumi Hall. Also from White Oak High School is Heather McGovern. 
She competes in three sports as well, uh, well, four sports, swimming, soccer, cross country, and volleyball. She's a state champion in soccer, and she has a 4.72 GPA. She will be attending a university this uh, fall. Her parents are Pam and Dan McGovern. Richlands High School's Kalina Taylor is unable to be with us due to her prom. Kalina participates in tennis, basketball, and soccer. She's earned multiple awards in her sports, including a prestigious local award from her school, the Richlands High School Female Athlete of the Year. She will be attending UNC Chapel Hill in the fall and will major in the health field. Her parents are John and Holly Taylor. Also, our next winner is at her prom this evening. She's from Swansboro High School. She competes in volleyball, basketball, and track. Kylie Cleave was awarded all conference and all county honors in track and field. She excels academically and holds a current 4.857 GPA. She will be attending a university. We believe that it is NC State. We don't have that for sure but she will be majoring in chemistry, and her parents are DeWitt and Angela Cleave. <laughs> Madison Malfitano is from Northside High School. She competes in baseball, winter track, and cross country. She is a two-time all-county, I'm sorry? Well, I'm sorry about that. I'm reading my notes that were passed to me. <laughs> he competes in baseball, winter track, and cross country. He is an all-time county, an all, two-time all-county honorable mention and holds an impressive 4.92 GPA. He's planning on turning, uh, attending a university in the fall to study pre-med, and his parents are Timothy and Josephine Malfitano. Our final winner is Daisha Williams, also from Northside. She competes in cross country, track, cheerleading, and lacrosse. She volunteers with the Onslow County Animal Shelter and is a Red Cross Blood Drive volunteer. She plans to attend UNC Wilmington in the fall where she will study criminal justice. Her parents are Juan Carlos and Hope Realis. I wish that I could say that I had a GPA that looked like theirs, and uh, I wish you well, and all of us here in this room know that your dreams are going to come true because you've already proven you have the work ethic to do that. Let's give them a round of applause for our Wendy's <laughs> High School Heisman winners. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Pam. Once again, let's congratulate all the Heisman winners one more time. They're well deserved. <laughs> I think their efforts show how important uh, not only athletics is, but the fact they are student athletes and their GPAs speak highly of that. And I only wish each and every one of you the best in your future endeavors. Next, I'd like to introduce Carol McIntyre, our Vice Chairman, to come forward to introduce our high school state champions and our high school special recognitions. Thank you, Mike. <laughs> there was much to be excited about in high school athletics this year. We have state champions both as a team and individually. We also have coaches recognized for their hard work and their dedication. We here in Onslow County are very fortunate 
to have both talented athletes and dedicated coaches. I know many of our students and coaches are not in attendance tonight. Um, so if you're here, please stand when I call your name um, and, and as well as your family. Our first coach led his team to an 18-4-1 season record in the 2013 Girls 2A State Championship in soccer with a national ranking of 122. Congratulations to Swansboro High School Pirates and their head coach, Doug Kidd. Yeah, if you're here, you can come forward. If you're not, I don't guess you can. This next coach was awarded the 2013 State Assistant Coach of the Year Award from White Oak High School Girls Varsity Soccer Coach Molly Stitz. The next coach was awarded the 2013 Region 4 Coach of the Year Award from Jacksonville High School Varsity Boys Soccer Team Coach David Miller. Now for our student athletes. Our first individual state champion won the 138 pound weight class in the 2014 2A State Wrestling Championship. He is also only one of 13 in North Carolina history to be a four time state finalist. Congratulations to Joby Armetta of Southwest High School. Our next individual state champion won the 160-pound weight class in the 2014 2A State Wrestling Championship. Congratulations to Zach Weingartner, also of Southwest High School. In the spring of 2013, this female athlete completed a 39 .09 meters discus throw to become the 2013 3A state champion in discus. Congratulations to Jacksonville High School's Lissa Wallace O'Neill. <laughs> Our next individual state champion completed her season in track with a triple jump of 39 feet to become the 2013 1A Triple Jump State Champion. Congratulations to Cassandra Tatum of Lejeune High School. Let's give all these winners a big applause. Thank you, Carol. Congratulations again to all of our state champions and our high school special award winners. Our excellent in athletics within Oslo County extends beyond the high school arena. And I'd like to welcome Kim Oliver, Jackson Oslo Sports Commission board member to come forward to recognize these athletes. Thank you, Mike. It's my privilege to introduce the next three award winners. All three recipients have made Onslow County very proud. Each year, the Marine Corps formally recognizes the outstanding male and female athletes among its ranks. This year, both of these superior Marines happen to also be residents, if only temporarily, of Onslow County. Unfortunately, neither of these athletes is able to be with us tonight due to a prior engagement and to a recovery from surgery. Graciously, Colonel Clark, Deputy Commander, Marine Corps Installations East, Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, and Sergeant Major Barry, Marine Corps Installations East, Marine Corps Base, Camp Lejeune, are here to accept on their behalf. Our first athlete is a logistics officer at Marine Corps Air Station, New River, and is currently serving as the operations officer and headquarters and service company commander for MWSS 272. That probably means something to somebody who isn't involved in them. <laughs> she was the top female finisher for the Marine Corps at the 2013 Armed Forces Triathlon Championship and the 2013 Armed Forces Marathon Championship. She's also the first place overall active duty female Marine in the 2013 Marine Corps Marathon. Congratulations to the 2013 Marine Corps Female Athlete of the Year, Captain Christine Toronto. <laughs> Our
Our second athlete is an infantry unit leader aboard Marine Corps Base Camp Lejeune, as in currently a member of the USA wrestling team preparing for the 2016 Olympics. He placed second at the US World Team Trials and won gold in both Greco-Roman and freestyle wrestling at the 2013 Armed Forces Championship. Congratulations to the 2013 Marine Corps Male Athlete of the Year, Staff Sergeant David Arendt, Jr. Thank you, gentlemen, for representing your Marines here. We know you're as proud of them as we are able, you, we know you are as proud as we are to be able to claim them. Our final special recognition tonight goes to the winner of the 2013 Rolex Bob Snodgrass Award in Excellence. This award recognizes the team leader, team, excuse me, team owner or manager who demonstrates the qualities of integrity, passion for the sport, and love of cars for which Bob Snodgrass was known during his life and career. Compiling four wins in 2013, a third place overall finish for the year in the GT season standings, and a second place overall finish in the GS team standings for 2013. Please join me in congratulating Stevenson Motorsports owner, John Stevenson. I think I'm moving right into the next one, sorry. And this one's not in my big text, so we might be struggling here. Um, before we recognize our class of, 14, 20, uh, class of 2014 High Hall of Fame inductees, I would like to recognize past inductees of the Jacksonville Onzo Sports Hall of Fame. As you hear your name, please stand. And I don't have the list of... And now I have it. Okay. Tonight we have uh, Roosevelt Sanders. I know I saw him. Yes. He was in the, he's from the class of 2006. From the class of 2008, we have Coach Tom McGee and Joanne Riggs. Joan Riggs, excuse me. From the class of 2009, we have Bob Vroom. From the class of 2010, Francisco Blanco. From the class of 2011, Ron Holtzford. From a class of 2012, Phil Paget. Oh. <laughs> From the class of 2013, Mike Smith. I'm getting a strange finger point from Kopka, so I'm not exactly sure what. Um, is Ray Durham here? There's a check mark here. Okay, yes, I didn't want to miss him. Class of 2006, Ray Durham as well. Uh, our class of 2014 will be joining an amazing group of individuals. Thank you all for being with us this evening. Now, as we recognize our class of 2014, oh, I would like to recognize myself. <laughs> Sorry, that was going to be Mike, Mike Lazara. Um, each year, the Jacksonville Onzo Sports Commission accepts nominations for the Jacksonville Onzo Sports Hall of Fame. Consideration is, giving to, is given to character, integrity, and sportsmanship, while other criteria must also be filled. Criteria includes athletes who achieved state or national recognition and was born or raised in Onzo County or had at least two years of athletic achievement while a resident of Onzo County or was in the military stationed at Camp Lejeune, Camp Geiger, Camp Johnson, or Marine Corps Air Station, New River, when he or she achieved their level of recognition or attended at least two years of high school in Onzo County. Phew. Nominated persons can also be a coach or special contributor who has made a significant impact on sports in Onzo County. This year, the selected inductees were great contributors to Onzo County. They each gave, and still give, generously, of their time to see sport progress in the community. Let's meet our first inductee. Ken moved here and like got hired in 69 and 
He came from, uh, he was in the Marine Corps out stationed out in California. And one of Ken's pet peeves is Ken doesn't like to fly. So he got an interview. His wife is from this area. And he, he drove from California to Jacksonville, North Carolina for an interview. And, and he was fortunate enough to get his job back in the 69. Well, I came to Jacksonville in the late 1970s. Uh, when I came, Ken was already here. He was working with the Recreation Department. And more important to me, he was uh, the voice of the Cardinals. Uh, he remained in those jobs for over 30 years. And throughout those years, we developed a, a great relationship. Uh, I learned quickly going over to a Recreation Department that uh, he enjoyed things like an occasional game of ping pong, uh, playing tennis on Saturday some, game a horse occasionally in the gym, and he didn't like to lose. And usually uh, donuts were involved somewhere in bringing donuts the next morning they lost. Well, some of Ken's things about Ken was he, he liked chocolate. He was a big m and person. He'd bet anybody on anything for a milkshake. Uh, that was one of Ken's big things. We had a game one night softball, and and we were we just had enough to play. And uh, and the fellow that was catching probably wasn't the best softball player in the world. And we were playing with a real strong team, and they had the bases loaded. And there might have been one out. And I'm playing third, and Ken's pitching. And Ken looks over at me and says, "Mike, the ball's hit to you. Do not throw it home because Ken just can see nothing but the guy on third just crashing over this guy catching and hurting him." Well, Ken threw a couple pitches, and then all of a sudden, next pitch, it's a one hopper to me, and I mean, just you know, instinct kicks in, and I field it, throw a strike to the plate, and luckily the guy caught it and got out of the way, and Ken gets the ball back and looks at me and says, what did I just tell you? <laughs> well, probably the funniest things were later on when I was working a little bit with Ken in the booth, and uh, he would ask questions that, he said, who got that kickoff return? And I said, Ooh, I wouldn't watch it, Ken. So uh, <laughs> he was a lot better in the booth than I was. It didn't take long before I realized what a comp caring person he was. Very caring. He cared about the kids. It wasn't just a job to him. And he had their concern first. I can remember one of the issues that came up. I had coached Little League Baseball before. And one of the most difficult things was cutting players. In those days, you had a roster. You had so many uniforms and uh, to have to cut a player. And it didn't seem right when you consider that their parents paid taxes, they were citizens of Jacksonville, and to play Little League Baseball shouldn't have anything to do with how good they were in sports. And Ken felt like sports were for all kids. And I think that's a very important principle. And so our philosophy there and with his leadership was if we need more positions and more more room on the roster, then our job is to go out and get more sponsors to make sure we have teams so every kid can play. He probably influenced more kids maybe than any other single person in Oslo County and continues to do it to this day. Ken, it's a pleasure to stand here today and tell you congratulations for your induction into the Hall of Fame. It's well deserving. Uh, I know that uh, some of our former staff members who are no longer with us, they would be here telling you the same thing. and. Um, and I know I'm very appreciative of all you did for me over the 28 years I knew you working with the rec department in the city. Ken, I'd say congratulations. I'm very, very proud of you, and I think you're very deserving. Uh, you have led so many kids to sports and to the lessons learned in sports, and you are truly one of my heroes. Congratulations, Ken. Pass due. Fame inductee, Mr. Ken Hagen. Thank you very much. I don't know where they got that picture of me as a 13 year old, but well, that was me. And Mike, how much did you have to pay all those guys to say those nice things about me, by the way? Was... As somebody who has been a supporter 
of the Onslow Sports Commission since its inception. As a matter of fact, uh, had the privilege of being on the committee that formed the Onslow Jacksonville Sports Commission. It's a great honor to be here tonight as the recipient of being inducted into the Hall of Fame. This becomes my second Hall of Fame. I was fortunate enough in the year 2010 to be inducted into the North Carolina Recreation and Parks Association Hall of Fame, <clears throat> and I was the, uh, the fourth member to be inducted into their Hall of Fame. And as a kid, I used to uh, fantasize about being inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame. <laughs> and I can tell you that um, being inducted to, into these two Hall of Fames would even surpass the Baseball Hall of Fame if I was good enough to play there, which uh, obviously I'm not, or I would be there. But um, the reason for that is, is very simple. I worked in parks and recreation for almost 35 years, and it became a passion of mine, both at the local level and on the state level. And so for your peers to recognize you uh, for what they feel you've accomplished is, is just a wonderful feeling. And to do the same thing here in Jacksonville and Onslow County, uh, I have the same feeling because these are my peers. These are the people that judge you. The one thing that I have learned in life, you can pat yourself on the back as much as you want, but it's other people that determine exactly how they feel about you. And I take this as a great honor and I take this as, as, as a compliment to myself and my family. There's a lot of people that, that I need to thank for being here tonight. And the first person that I want to thank is already in the Hall of Fame. And that would be Coach Tom McGee. Tom, for the past few years, uh, would every time I would see him, he would pester me and say, you're supposed to be in the Hall of Fame. I don't understand why you're not in the Hall of Fame. And I would give him the same reply every time. And I'd say, Tom, you have to be nominated, and then you have to be voted on by uh, the folks that vote, and then it goes from there. Well, somebody needs to do something about it. Well, this went on for about four or five years, and I was sitting on my back porch one afternoon, and up the sidewalk come Tom McGee, application in his hand. He said, here, fill this out. I'm going to get you nominated which he did. So Tom, thank you very much. I appreciate that. I want to thank Mike Carter uh, for emceeing tonight and being by my side all of these years. And uh, by the way, if you do a real good job tonight, you're going to get this job permanently. So watch out. I want to thank the members of the Sports Commission and the members that vote for the Hall of Fame for inducting me in. Um, it is one of the greatest honors that I've ever had here in Onslow County. And I want to congratulate my co-inductee, uh, Coach Ronnie Ross, uh, also well-deserved and long overdue. So it pleases me to go in in the class of 2014 with Coach Ross. And now I'd like to introduce the people that are most important to me, and that would be my family. And um, they always kid me about what I've done and how long I've been here and the people that I know. And they are, they're quite impressed with their grandfather from the standpoint that every time they come to Jacksonville, uh, I run into people that I know if we go out somewhere. And uh, being young like they are, they go, well, you know everybody in Jacksonville. Why is that? So uh, when they first learned that I was going to receive this honor, they were very excited about it and, uh, and uh, continued to tease me about it. So I'd like to introduce three of my four grandchildren who are with me tonight. And the fourth one who's not is not here, Bradley Gardner, because he is competing in a state competition in Virginia called Odyssey of the Mine, um, and the competition just happened to fall on today, and he's very disappointed that he's not able to be here 
but uh, he is certainly in my, in my heart. But I have with me uh, this evening my grandson who attends, <coughs> I hate to say this, <laughs> being a big Duke fan, but he is attending UNC at Chapel Hill. Uh, Tyler, Gar Tyler Hagen. And his sister, who attends Topsail Middle School, Kensley Hagen. And her cousin, Frankie Garner. Now, can't you just tell how excited they are for me to do that? I also would like to introduce my two children, uh, Scott Hagen, who I had the privilege of coaching actually in, in high school at, on the JV team, which uh, was, a, was a highlight of, of my career, and also broadcast his football games when I was in the booth. Scott? And I'd like to introduce my daughter, who has always been my biggest champion. She has uh, always pushed me and prodded and wanted to know why certain things weren't happening in Onslow County and Jacksonville. And she's actually the one that called me to announce to me, along with my granddaughter, Frankie, that I had been inducted into the Jacksonville Onslow Hall of Fame. She was very excited about it, as Frankie was, and I was very pleased that they were able to make that phone call. So she's also here with her husband, Jim Garner. So Karen and Jim. Now you have heard this over and over and over, that behind every man is a great woman. Now let me tell you something. That is true here, more so than you'll ever know, because of all of the things that you see listed on this resume of mine, she was there every step of the way, except for the first one, because I didn't know her then. <laughs> and she did the sacrifices that it took for my career to blossom and also for all of the crazy things that I would do in the arena of athletics, the broadcasting, the, the traveling and, and all of that. And when you do the, the football games and Coach Durham and any of the football coaches here can attest to this, you give up, or at least in my case, they give up even more, you give up all your Fridays for four months because you're involved with high school football. And if you're real smart, you give up the Saturdays and the Mondays too, because if there's a rain out, guess what? You're playing those nights. When you're off broadcasting minor league baseball and 40 miles away, uh, somebody has to keep the home. So I'm standing here tonight, but Cindy, my wife, should be standing here with me as well, because for 50 years, She's been by my side in anything that I've accomplished that people have recognized. She has been a large part of making that happen. So, Cindy, thank you very much. I'll tell you how, how devoted she is. When I, when I first got out of the Marine Corps, I was out in California. And... I was working for the government as a weatherman. Actually, I was a weatherman in the Marines. Now, these, these Marines here are Marines, okay? Um, and I'm sure they're sitting there going, this guy was in the Marines, but he was a weatherman? <laughs> and my first duty station was over at New River. And um, when I got out of the Marine Corps, I went to work for the federal government. Uh, and I stayed in the weather field. I was called a climatologist. It's even hard to say. Uh, basically a person that kept up with the history of, of climate in the San Diego area. And then after uh, a 10 month period of time, my job was rift. And for those of you that live in this community and are familiar with that term, I was never familiar with it until they told me that I was rift, which basically means you're fired. <laughs> and um, so I got out and I, I talked to Cindy about, well, what do we do next? And I said, well, I love sports. I love kids. I want to get involved with some type of sports activity. So one afternoon, I came home with the harebrained idea of becoming a major league umpire. So 
she said, okay, if that's what you want to do. So I wrote a resume out, sent it in to Florida, and I got accepted. So I'm going to go off to umpiring school. Well, fortunately for her and for me, um, a job was open in Jacksonville that her father found out about and wrote us and called us and told us about it, and I applied for it. And as Mike told you, I was fortunate enough to get it. And I, I figured, you know, when I, Rex Bird was the person that hired me. He was the recreation director. And when he, he called me up and said, uh, I like your resume, I'd like to interview you. Uh, can you come to Jacksonville? I said, sure. And Cindy, by the way, is from Jacksonville, so I was familiar with Jacksonville. I said, sure. So we talked a little bit, and then he said, um, well, what time will you be flying in, and when can I come pick you up? This was on a, um, this was on a weekend. And I said, well, I won't be flying. He said, well, how are you going to get here? I said, I'm going to drive. He said, you're going to drive from California? I said, yeah, I don't like to fly. So he said, well, how long will it take you? I said, well, set the interview up, and I'll be there. So I said, uh, but I do have an umpire uh, job that I have to do on Monday night, so, you know, I can be. He said, well, how about Friday? I said, fine, no problem. So I did the umpiring job at, at one of the local high schools. Cindy and I jumped in the car, and we drove. Yeah, Scott was a little baby at the time. Uh, we drove across country, and I left San Diego at 6 o'clock. Are there any highway patrolmen in here? <laughs> I left uh, San Diego at 6 o'clock on a Monday evening and pulled into Jacksonville at 3.15 on Wednesday afternoon. Needless to say, we drove all night. And needless to say, we broke many, many speed uh, records, not records, but certainly limits. But to top that off, um, I had to be back in San Diego on Monday. So I did the interview on Friday, and we jumped back in the car on Saturday and took off for San Diego, and I was able to get back there to meet my commitment back in San Diego. And I kind of figured that one of two things was going to happen with this job. I figured the gentleman that was interviewing me would think I was so stupid and dumb to have driven all the way across country for a job that paid $5,000 a year. Or he would think that I was somebody with so much initiative he couldn't pass me by and would hire me. Well, as, it would have, as history would have it, he hired me. But that's not the reason he hired me. I didn't find this out until about a year later, and I asked him, I said, uh, you know, my resume was not that outstanding. What, what made you hire me? And I was really thinking he was going to say, well, you know, he came out for the blah, blah, blah. Uh-uh. He said, well, on your resume, you had put on there that you had coached while you were in the Marine Corps at the Infant of Prague School, the eighth grade basketball team. He said, I thought anybody that would take the time as a young Marine to coach young kids in a town that he wasn't raised in, in a place that he didn't know, was somebody that I wanted to hire. And I guess the moral of that story is that you don't know when you do something exactly how it's going to turn out. But as, it, as that turned out, that was the thing that got me the job. So I want to thank Rex Bird for hiring me those many years ago. And I want to thank the city managers that I've worked for down through the years because they allowed me the time to do all of the crazy things that I wound up doing. Pat Thomas, Bob Ray, who hired me as the recreation director after Rex left, and Jerry Bittner, who was my last uh, or next to last city manager that I worked for, um, also supported me and allowed me to do the various things that I did down through the years. So I want to, th I want to thank them uh, very much. And I also want to thank uh, Chris Miller from the Daily News for putting on uh, or, or writing that great article this morning uh, about my, myself and my family. That was a great, a good article, Chris. I, I certainly appreciate that. 
my broadcasting career at WJNC uh, was given to me by Bob Mendelson. Bob owned the station at the time. It's a name I'm sure that Glenn Hargett back there right now is thinking, whoa, there's one from way back there. But Bob uh, hired me to, uh, to do the, the football games, and I always appreciated that. And the station managers that followed him, Ron Brown, um, continued to support me. Glenn Hargett continued to support me. And then, of course, North Johnson, who was the general manager for the Kinston Indians, who also hired me. Now, let me tell you something. You're looking at a person who, for some reason, always impressed other people. And they were the ones that saw something in me that I thought was there, but they, they saw it and they acted on it because they gave me opportunities that I otherwise would not have had. And that's why I'm so appreciative for the folks that along the way made sure that I was able to accomplish some of the things that I was. The broadcasting, uh, I did 31 years or actually 32 years of Cardinal football and missed one game. And the only reason I missed that is I had a bad back and I thought I was gonna be able to make that game. And Ray Durham knows all about bad backs. Uh, I just couldn't get out of bed and I, I, I fussed about it, and just didn't like it, but I did have to miss the one game. I did the Kinston Indians for seven years and that was something that I always wanted to do minor league baseball. I've done a lot of things that I wanted to do and I actually had a bucket list before I knew what a bucket list was, before there was even a term of a bucket list. I just had things in my mind that I knew that I would like to try and do if I ever got the opportunity. One of them was coaching a high school baseball team. Now, how crazy is that? I'm a recreation person. I don't work for the schools. But I wanted to coach a high school baseball team if the opportunity ever came. So how, how do opportunities like that come along? I want to talk to the young people because you're the ones that are starting off in life. I don't care how young you are. You're starting off in life, and people will tell you that you've got to make your own way. You've got to there's lots of things that you don't control, but let me tell you something. You control your life. And I'm going to tell you how you do that in just a minute, or at least how I did mine. But the opportunity did come along. Uh, Robbie Ellis, who a lot of you know, former coach here in Onslow County, worked for us during the summer. He was the baseball coach at Jacksonville High School. He wanted to start a JV baseball program, which they didn't have at the time. And uh, he knew I had a passion for baseball. And he asked me if he started a JV program, would I coach it? And I said, you better believe it. So he talked uh, Mr. Padgett into uh, getting a, a JV team. And I coached that for uh, seven years. And then during one of those years, uh, Robbie left. And Jacksonville hired, Ray, you'll remember this, Jacksonville hired a baseball coach from out of state. I don't remember exactly where he was. And I'm not sure if he even came to Jacksonville or was about to. But anyway, at the last minute, he backed out. So they were left without a baseball coach. I saw an opportunity. The opportunity was there wasn't anybody on the staff that wanted to coach baseball. Not that they couldn't, but they didn't want to, and I knew that. And so I went to Ray as the athletic director and said, look, I think I can work things out and be your varsity coach for one year. And he said, well, Ken, I, I appreciate that. He said, but that's Mr. Padgett's call, and I don't think he's going to go for that. So I went to see Mr. Padgett and told him that the baseball program had progressed to a point where I didn't want to see it to go backwards. I knew he didn't have anybody on the staff that wanted the job and that if he would see fit, I would love to coach the high school team. He looked at me and said, that's not going to happen because I have to have a staff member. 
somebody that works for the school to be the coach. And I said, I understand perfectly. Well, I guess they had a hard time finding somebody because about a month later he called and asked me if I was still interested, and I said yes. So I coached the high school baseball team for one year, which, you know, in the scheme of things, I'm sure a lot of you are sitting out there and say, well, what's the big deal about that? It was a big deal to me because it's a goal that I had set that I thought I would never be able to accomplish. The same thing is true of broadcasting minor league baseball. I wanted to do that with a passion. But guess what? There wasn't any minor league baseball within 100 miles of Jacksonville until the Kinston Indians came along. Well, actually, it wasn't the Indians. It was an independent team. So I went up there, and I bugged those folks. And uh, the, the owners said, we're not interested in doing radio. We're not going to do the ball games. I said, fine. So the next year, I went back. Same scenario. No, we're not doing, not doing the games. Then the team was sold. New owners came in. They, weren't, they were interested in, in doing it, but they hadn't gotten uh, ownership quick enough, didn't have sponsors, a lot of things, and said, um, come back, talk to us next year. Well, about halfway through the year, I'm riding down the road, don't remember where, and uh, turn on the radio, and one of the local stations is doing a Kinston Indians baseball game. And Cindy was with me, and I said, what in the world is going on here? They told me they weren't doing baseball. The guys weren't very good. They were disc jockeys doing a baseball game. Go figure that out, you know. And so every once in a while, they would tell you what was going on. Oh, by the way, it's the fourth inning, and the score is four to two. Uh-huh. Which team's got the four and which one's got the two? You get the picture. That was on a Saturday night. Monday, I called in, said I need a half a day off, got in the car, drove to Newbern where the radio station was, went in, wanted to see the station manager. Station manager says, I don't know Ken Hagen. What's he want? Well, he wants to talk to you about the baseball games. Oh, send him in. So I went in, and I told him. I said, look, I have a passion for baseball. I'd love to do your games. How many more are you doing? Well, actually, during the broadcast, they had said they were going to do 10 that year, so they had nine more. I said, and I didn't want to, you know, certainly embarrass him or, or say how bad I thought these guys were. But he said, oh, my goodness gracious, thank you for coming in. You are hired. And I said, well, you don't know anything about me. He said, I don't care. You've got to be better than what I had on there the other night. <laughs> I said, well, don't they work for you? And he said, yeah. But he said, they don't know anything about baseball. So that's how I was able to, to start uh, doing some baseball games. I did the, those nine games for the rest of the year. They were all on the weekend. And I built up a tape resume. And the next year... Uh, North Johnson came along as the uh, general manager for the Kinston Indians. And uh, I once again got in the car, went to see North, and said, uh, look, I'd, I'd love to be able to do the games. I said, I know I, I, I cannot be your regular broadcaster because I can't go on the road, but I'd like to be your backup and I'd like to do the home games. And he said, well, I've already hired a broadcaster. He said, but that's intriguing. He said, I, I think he'd probably need some help. He said, let me think about it. So the next week, he called me back, and he said, if you're serious about it, I, I'd, I'd like to talk to you about it. So I went back and visited with him. He said, well, let me talk to the broadcaster that I've hired and make sure he's comfortable with it. I said, fine. And as it turned out, uh, he was comfortable with it. Well, I don't know if he was or not, but anyway, North Johnson was comfortable with me, and that was the important thing. And so I started doing the uh, Kinston Indian Games as the uh, backup announcer. And before the year was out, this particular announcer left. He had some health problems. And I wound up doing the last month of the season, both uh, home and away. Fortunately, their away games were in Durham and Winston-Salem. So I was able to swing that, took a few days off of, of leave. Mike backing me up, as always. And uh, was able to complete that year. And as it turned out, I wound up doing uh, seven years up in Kinston uh, of minor league baseball again. Just unbelievable what you can do if you take the bull by the horn and go to the right people and make yourself available. As it turned out, I was able to accomplish the second big item on my bucket list.
I want to also thank the citizens of Jacksonville and Onslow County for supporting me for as many years as they have. When it first became uh, knowledge that I was going to be inducted into this Hall of Fame, uh, I've had so many people from around the community congratulate me, uh, call me, uh, see me in the store or in the street and stop me and congratulate and say, uh, well deserved, long overdue, uh, all of those things. But, you know, it's been my pleasure to be involved with the sports here in Onslow County and, and Jacksonville and Camp Lejeune uh, all these years. And it has made me the kind of person that I am. And I can't say enough to the community for supporting me and supporting what I believed in, the recreation, uh, to make this a, a better place to live for, the, for ourselves and, and for our children. And so I always use the term barriers because I think barriers are what prevents us from achieving what we want to achieve. Now, barriers come in different forms. Some people call them roadblocks. Some people even call them rules and regulations, which they are. But to me, they were barriers. I had a barrier that prevented me from being a baseball coach but I didn't for a high school team, but I didn't let that stop me. I had a barrier for broadcasting minor league baseball because first of all I didn't have a team but even after that I didn't let that stop me I went to where I knew the person that would be making the decision was and and convinced him that I could do just that so these barriers need to be met they need to be gone around over through under any way as a young person that you can take these barriers and not let them interfere with what you want to do don't let anybody make a decision for you. Don't let anybody tell you you can't do something because you can if you want it bad enough. You make it happen. Don't wait, don't wait for somebody else to make it happen for you. You make it happen for yourself. I've been doing that all my life. It's worked for me. It's been very successful. And I would challenge all of the young people in the room today to follow that, do not let any barrier interfere with what you want to do with your life or with your leisure time or the activities that you want to be engaged in. In closing, I will, I will tell you a story that I told when I retired. And that is, when I was the recreation director and working in recreation, I met a lot of young people and I came to realize later in my career that I influenced these young people in a way that I didn't realize during the time I was doing it. Mike knows what I'm talking about because David Lynch is here and Mike LaCourie, all of us in recreation. We were influence, influencing the young people that, and we didn't even realize it. And what brought it home for me and has been the greatest compliment that I've ever received about anything that I ever did. It was one night coming back late from a, a basketball game. I stopped for gas. And as I get out to pump my gas, there was a young gentleman that came out of the convenience store and was getting ready to get into his vehicle. And he looked at me and I looked at him. And I, I recognized the face, but I couldn't make a connection with the name. He recognized me, he kind of nodded, I nodded back. He got in his vehicle and he started to leave and then he backed up and he rolled his window down. And he looked at me and he said, Mr. Hagen, I want to thank you for taking care of us boys at Jack Amiet all these years. And he rolled his window up and he took off. I don't know his name, but I knew then that I had touched a lot more lives than I had realized by just doing my job. I had never received a higher compliment or, or thank you from anybody than what that young man gave me that night. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much for this honor. Thank you very much for being here tonight. And again, Ronnie, congratulations. And that's all I've got to say.
Congratulations, Ken. Now, it's time to meet our second inductee. first came to Swansboro, Ronnie was the athletic director at the school and he took me in under his wing. He and his wife Dolores literally fed me sometimes and uh, he showed me everything to do about being an athletic director. I couldn't have had a better mentor when I first started teaching. Uh, I've had some coaches that have been mentors to me but Ronnie, he showed me the ropes and how to be an athletic director and how to run the program. Well, the, the one thing that Coach Ross did was um, he, he did everything himself. Um, and that's one of the things that I kind of learned from him. Uh, if you assume that other people are going to do it, it's probably not going to get done. Um, but he, he showed and instilled a, a great work ethic in me in that line. Um, him and I did all the fields, uh, painting the fields, chalking the fields, all that kind of stuff. And to the day I retired, that's exactly what I did. He was coaching men's basketball, and a lot, of, a lot of times the captains, three or four of them, would come over to the house on the weekends, maybe after practice, something to talk to them and go over stuff. And I just, I always thought that was really cool that they respected him. They came to the house, you know, talk to him. And it wasn't always just about basketball or sports. It was about, you know, other things in life. He gave me an opportunity. I never played quarterback before, and uh, asked him for a shot, and uh, got that shot. I didn't get it the three previous years. Uh, we won the. Uh, uh, coastal, 2A Coastal Plain Championship that year in football, basketball, and baseball. Uh, he's a hard charger, uh, high standards, uh, he holds us to high standards, and uh, he always got good results. He coached basketball, baseball, and football, um, and softball at one point, but I think basketball was his passion to coach, and I remember he would get very animated during the games. Um, I do remember a game where they had, the referees had to call a timeout because he jumped off the bench and slapped his hands together and his watch went in about 100 pieces across the floor. So they had to stop and pick up all the little pieces of the watch you know, before they could continue the game. Well, we went to a uh, conference meeting one time in Bayboro and, and I put the top down and him and I drove to Bayboro and Coach Ross does not like to get his hair messed up. And needless to say, in a vet, going down the road, especially those roads where you can kind of let it go a little bit. Uh, his hair was a mess by the time we got there. Uh, needless to say, when we came back, the top was up. We, we always had to go out at the football field and dig out the post that we put for the yard markers. And it was like 95 degrees in August every time we did it. And it seems like every year, Ronnie always had to go get some hasp for, hasp for the dock for the lockers during that time. And we've always kidded him about that. Where's Ronnie? He's getting some hasp, and it happened every year. We were, of course, around down in Pamlico County just before a basketball game. And by the time we got to Swansboro, the game had already started. It was in the first quarter. And we come, Biddy Bop there, ran down the locker room, and he came and said he wasn't going to let us play. He came out, boy, he did not want to let us play. And, uh, but he finally put it in. We told him, uh, told him that something happened. The car broke down. Coach, I guess now you know the car didn't broke down. We was horsing around that doing something that we weren't supposed to do. And, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's a great honor for you to, to get into the Hall of Fame, but one that's richly deserved. Um, and I just want to say thanks for all you've done. I'm happy for you. It's about time. I'm so glad that you finally got into where you deserve to be. Coach, I appreciate you a lot. I respect you a lot, and I love you a lot. And thank you for everything that you've ever done for me. And again, I would not be where I'm at today had it not been for you. And for that, I'm most grateful. Thank you, and congratulations again. Death, congratulations on being inducted to the Hall of Fame. Um, you've always been an inspiration to me. Um, that's why. I one had followed in your footsteps and uh, pretty much into the coaching field.
class of 2014 Jacksonville Onzo Sports Hall of Fame inductee, Ronnie Ross. I knew the story about the hasp was certainly going to come up when I saw John Lyles here tonight. I knew that was going to happen. And when he started to say, I just knew it was going to be what he's going to say. First of all, let me say that I'm a 1956 graduate of Swansboro High School. And after graduating from high school, my, my class size was 37. Go back that way, as you see, it was very small classes. Um, I, along with six other members of my class, we decided to join the Navy. So I did join the Navy and served a tour of duty in the Navy from 1956 to late 1959. At that time, I, I, knew I wanted to be a coach and a teacher, but when, it, when I first graduated from high school, I just wasn't ready to do that. So I just decided, along with the other gentlemen, to join the service. And it was actually, I got to travel in many different countries across the world, and it was education in itself to see how other people live throughout the world. So it, it turned out to be a good thing. So when I came back home, uh, late 59, decided I'd go to East Carolina, so I enrolled in East Carolina in 1960. I uh, went straight through in the summers, happened to work the classes out just right, graduated in 1963, and my former business teacher, Mr. Jim Frizzell, was the principal now at the high school, and he heard that I was going to be graduating, and he gave me a call and said he had a job for me, and uh, my first coaching job was coaching girls basketball. So. Uh, Got started there, and uh, um, the coaching girls basketball, I'm just going to throw out the fact that most of you probably never knew, uh, know the, what girls basketball was at that time. It was six players. There was three stationary offensive players on one end of the floor, three stationary defensive players on the other side of the floor. They could only, you could only dribble two dribbles before you passed the ball. I guess people figured girls just couldn't do much at all, and eventually, before time, time did change, and, and we, we put, it became uh, still six people, but uh, two of them would be rovers. So two could rove from one end to the other. The other two would be stationary offense and two stationary defense. So it's quite a bit of difference in basketball today, as you well know. Well, first of all, I'm totally humbled having been selected as an inductee into the Jacksonville Alonzo Sports Commission Hall of Fame. There's some great people who have been inducted, and I am extremely honored tonight to be recognized as a new inductee. I looked around, and I saw a lot of people that I know very well, Tom McGee, Ray Durham, Mike Smith, Homer, Homer Springs, Ron Holtzworth, Phil Padgett, uh, and Ron, I've already said Ron Holtzworth. So those are the ones of the people that I see tonight that I've been knowing a long time and we've worked with in many different ways athletically. I also was a... Uh, received a nice letter this week from Dr. Ken Morgan. He couldn't be here tonight because he's celebrating his 55th uh, graduation of his, from his dental school with his other dental buddies. And he wrote me a letter of congratulations. It meant a lot to me as the things he had to say. And he was saddened that he couldn't be here tonight. My career of 31 years includes a part of four decades, the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Many changes came about during these years from only three sports, but basically at that time, football, basketball, and baseball is what most of the schools had. Some schools didn't have football, just had basketball and baseball. Girls only had basketball at that time when it first started. But now, uh, as you know, most of the schools have anywhere from 18 to 20 sports now, and which includes, of course, JV sports. So quite a bit of change from the 60s through the 90s, as I was a part of. During my tenure as athletic director, Title IX came about, and Title IX said we must offer girls the same opportunity sports-wise as young men did. Not necessarily the same sport, but something comparable to the sports season. We made sure that that happened at Swansboro High School. We, uh, Joan Riggs was one of my former students, which is a member of the Hall of Fame. She came to work with us after graduating from UNCW in Wilmington. And uh, she, I, I, at that time, I had the entire physical education pro program. I was glad to see her become a part. She could take over the girls program. I didn't have to worry about that. 
and she did an excellent job, and we worked together for 20 years. She came in, we put in volleyball. She, she went to various clinics and learned a lot about volleyball. She learned so much that she won six titles in the state championship from Swansboro. She also became our softball coach. She even coached basketball a little bit, so she did it all for a while. But her main thing was volleyball, which I just mentioned. She did an excellent job. It was very exciting to, to have that involved. Uh, a little story about that. One of, her, <clears throat> one of the coaches of one of the schools outside the county that she played, which had an outstanding volleyball team over the years, he asked her one day, he said, what happens on, a, uh, on an afternoon when it's raining real hard and the football team can't go out and practice, what happens then? And she said, well, we have our regular practice, and then the football team comes into the gym afterwards. He said, that's not the case at my school. If, if it rains and the football team has to come inside, the girls' volleyball goes home. And that really wasn't right, but we, so we made sure we did things the right way because we knew the girls' sport program was just as important as the boys. I think Joan will certainly remember that. Coaching and taking care of the duties of being an athletic director is a tremendous undertaking but having had a great staff made it a lot easier uh, working in Swansboro, that's for sure. You've already saw, seen John Lyles here tonight. John Lyles came to us from a small school in um, South Carolina. He graduated from Atlantic Christian here in North Carolina, but he was working in uh, some place, I can't think of a little town in uh, um, South Carolina. But Barry Matthews, one of our faculty members, came to me one day after practice. He was a coach, I know a gentleman that had, Work real hard in track, nose track, run track at Atlantic Christian, and he'd be an asset to your program. And when he said track, I knew we knew, right then we were going to do what we could to get him there because we didn't know a thing about track. And uh, one of my assistant coaches would go to the library and read up about the shot put and the discus. And <laughs> that's true. That, that was John Merritt was working for us at the time. So we knew, we knew we had to do something. So when he told me that, I went right straight to Mr. Frizzell. And I said, Mr. Frizzell, we got this gentleman down in South Carolina needs a job. Mr. Brazell was a, one of the finest gentlemen I ever met. He said, we'll, we'll find a way to get him here. And eventually, uh, about mid-year, mid somebody left, and we brought in John Lyles. And, he, of course, he stayed with us until he uh, retired some years ago. But he's really not retired. He comes back, and he's still coaching track at the high school several years after retiring officially. He also works with the middle school and with, with a, when they have a, a field day and they have a track meet throughout the county, I think, with middle schools. And he works with some of the elementary schools as well. So he became a real asset to our school and certainly an asset to me as an athletic director. I also had, I'm, I've already mentioned Joan Riggs, uh, working together with her for 20 years and just the things that she did. And it was very exciting. I never thought I'd be excited about a volleyball game as much as we were. But there was times in our gym, the, 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 the excitement of volleyball was just as much as basketball and any other sports you know of. Our football team, when they came in, from practice, and if we had a game, the entire football team always stayed and watched volleyball. It was very exciting. John Lyles would tell you the same thing. We, we just loved to see him play volleyball. Then there was Jim Sheehan that you saw on the film there. He came along, Mr. Beasley called me in one morning and said, I talked to a young gentleman last night that graduated from South Carolina, and he's looking for a job. We were thinking about hiring him. said he's going to come out to football practice tonight. Let me know what you think about him. Well, he came out, I knew we were going we to keep him because we needed all the football coaches we could find, no matter who, where they came from. <laughs> Whether it's uh, probably the wrong Carolina, but anyway, we, we ended up hiring him, and he learned the JV system pretty quick and took over JV football and did an outstanding job. Eventually, he coached varsity football. He also caught, coached uh, baseball and did a good job. And all, as he said, he always worked with me as far as doing the fields because we always had, we had to take care of the football field, the soccer field, the softball field. A lot of work to be done, and he was always there to help. So, Jim, thanks a lot for what you did there. Bob Room, of course, came along, uh, a sport that we had never been involved with. Jim Sheehan and I began to use the name. I got it from Jim. I don't blame it on me, but he, he called it communist kickball. <laughs> so, uh, so we'd say we had to go out and, and take care of the communist kickball field. And, and the kids that played soccer, they got a kick out of that. They didn't, it was okay, fun to them for us to say that, so that's what we always said. So uh, Bob came along, and I forgot. How, Bob, is it six championships we have now? Uh, seven. Se excuse me, <laughs> seven. Seven state championships in, 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 in soccer. So, again, that was a, a tremendous uh, asset to our athletic program as well as to me as well. So 
fortunately, I've been fortunate to have outstanding coaches in, in our program. I've really been blessed to be around a lot of great athletes and a dedicated staff who've helped me make me what I am tonight. Some of the highlights real quick, 1970 undefeated football team. You saw the young black guy, on the African-American or whatever, here on the thing. That was Pete Gray. Pete Gray played for me uh, two years as a junior. He was, he was just a linebacker. I was assistant football coach at the time. The next year I was a varsity coach, and he, like you heard him say, he, we let him play quarterback because he could play quarterback. There's no doubt about it. Outstanding athlete. He was, he was all conference in football, basketball, and baseball. He came, his grandmother raised him. He didn't have a lot going for him through, through life. He got a scholarship to Livingston College to play football. He played freshman year. About sophomore year, the Army come looking for him. The draft situation had been sent to his grandmother back here in Oslo County, and somehow it never got to him, and there was some other athletes at the school the same way. So they decided it was best for him to enlist and get the two years or so over and then come back to college. Well, to make a long story short, this young man ended up retiring as a lieutenant colonel, has a daughter that is a, a doctor at Stanford University, has another daughter who's a studying law at Harvard University. So you just never know when you, sit, when you deal with young people what their lives are going to be like. But I'm, I'm so proud of what he has accomplished. Then I have, uh, in girls basketball, we had a young lady named Peace Shepard that played for us. She went on to play at North Carolina State, got full scholarship there. She played in the Final Four while being there. She later went on and played pro ball in Greece. Outstanding young lady, fine young lady. Enjoyed those years with her, of course. Then tonight we have Donna Panis is here tonight. She played basketball for me as well. She's about 5'6 in height, but I guarantee there's not anybody 6'2 that could out rebound her. I asked her tonight just how she did. She said, Coach, she said, Coach I was mean. <laughs> I think she put a little elbow in there once in a while, and around the conference people realize that when she's around the basket, you better get out of the way because she's going to get that rebound, that's for sure. So we won a couple of uh, county, I mean, conference championships while she was playing. And uh, the only, only problem I had with her was the fact that she wanted to practice on Saturdays, too. We practiced during the week, but she really, truly, she wanted us to have full practices on Saturday. Probably would have practiced on Sunday if we could have. That's just the kind of person she was. So, uh, Donna, I appreciate you being here tonight. You've always been a, uh, been a tremendous amount to me as a young lady, as, as you are, and as a basketball player as well. Then another, one other person, uh, Johnny Hyten, was a trainer of ours, and I've collared many times on him. Johnny Hyten, and he come running. He's the best high school trainer I know of. There may be someone that was better somewhere. I don't know where it would be, but he was outstanding. He, could, he really learned to, to, to the, uh, when we get coaching clinics, they had a student trainer clinic, and he went every summer with us. He learned to uh, wrap ankles really well and do things that we needed athletically, and he, got, he was so good. Jim Sheehan had a little something to do with this. He got a full scholarship to the University of South Carolina as a trainer. And while he was there, they won the Gator Bowl, and he he's proudly wears the Gator Bowl ring today as a trainer. He was a tremendous young man. He called me from Charlotte yesterday. He was out of town on a special kind of conference meeting of some kind he was in, and he called me and congratulated, congratulated me on my induction here. And we're sorry that he couldn't be here, but that, that just tells you what might can happen to so him. He just he was not an athlete. He only was about five five and about 135 pounds, but he, he found a way to do the things that he did in life. And a, a gentleman here tonight also named Claude Cruz uh, was not on our staff, but he in 1969 and 70 he came to Swansburg. He was the uh, Hammocks Beach State Park. He was the superintendent there. And he was in, 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 excited about athletics and young people. And he came to me about running the clock in football and maybe some in basketball, primarily in football. That gentleman has been running our clock for over 40 years, still running the clock in football each and every year and probably will as long as he lives. So, Mr. Claude, you've been here now. I appreciate you being here, and thank you for all the work that you've done for us at, at high school as far as running the clock. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm being warned I've got about five minutes back there. <laughs> so those are the people that I wanted to highlight. A lot of other athletes that we've been involved with, but those are the ones I wanted to highlight. 
and some of the things they might have done. The Swansboro community support has been exceptional. Uh, we have what we call the Swansboro High School Century Club. It's, it's, it's been in, we've had it for 33 years. This coming year will be the 34th year. I'm one of the co-founders of the Century Club. Uh, what it is, we sell contracts, $200 contract that, that people that buy get two free passes to all the athletic contests, high school and the middle school. They also get to come to a special event that we have every year called the Toast of the Coast. The first one I know of is called the Feast of the East at White High School. We're the second one, Toast of the Coast. And it's really a nice uh, thing for the people to come to. Like I said, this will be the 34th year that we've been involved in. We've done a lot of great things for our athletic teams and program over the years. I can't name them all, but we'll name two things. We borrowed $50,000 when our football field was put in at New High School. The county didn't have any money. It was not a turnkey job like, let's say, Northside was, which was a great thing. But we, didn't, we had a field, but we didn't have any lights. So the Central Club went out and borrowed $50,000 to put lights in. Got that thing, paid that off. We eventually put in a six-court tennis complex, borrowed $45,000 to put that in. And, and three or four years ago, we borrowed $90,000 to re-rubberize our track. We had one of the only rubber tr uh, tr tracks in, in eastern North Carolina. Only problem is after eight to ten years, you got a problem with rubber. you got to come back and cover it again. It cost us $90,000 to do that. We, we have one payment left of $9,200, which is due on August 18th. We'll pay that off this year, and we'll get back to normal again. Principals Jim Frizzell and Joe Beasley helped me as an athletic director in trying to provide our coaches and athletes with the things that they needed to be competitive with other schools. In closing, I can say that God blessed me with the opportunity to be involved in athletics for 31 years, but more important, blessed me with a wife of soon to be 54 years who has always been there for me and also my son, my daughter, and my grandchildren as well. And I'd like to recognize them just as Ken did. And I'll start with the grandchildren, as, as he did. Um, my youngest granddaughter is here, Mary Beth. If you'll stand, Mary Beth. Just. Mary Beth is now doing her student teaching at Sand Ridge Elementary. We'll be hopefully finding a job somewhere in Onslow County as in the elementary education field next fall. Uh, the other granddaughter is Christina. Christina, if you'll stand. Okay. Christina is, in her, Christina is in her fourth year in teaching math at Swansboro High School. And then uh, we've got her husband, just recently married two weeks ago, Stephen Golden is here. You can stand up, Stephen, if you will. Okay. And w one of my grandsons here, Russell Ross, he's a study in computer training. And, and the youngest grandson here is Ryan. He's somewhere by the hill stand up. Ryan's in the fifth grade. There we go. And I think we covered all the grandchildren in that round, uh, and then my, my daughter, Sue Allen, which is also works at Swansboro Elementary School, <laughs> secretary and bookkeeper, and then my, grand, uh, my, my, uh, my daughter-in-law, Laura, which is a librarian at Queens Creek Elementary, <laughs> and of course, my son, Rusty, which is currently, as you know, the athletic director at Swansboro High School. I've already said that she was in August the 28th. If we lived that long, the Lord and I will have been married 54 years, and she's certainly been my inspiration on these. Lord, if you would stand. Thank you. Finally, to the many athletes that I've had the privilege to coach, thank you for your dedication and your commitment. It is because of you that I stand here tonight accepting this honor. Again, thanks to the Sports Commission and the committee members who made it this special night possible, and all of my family and friends here tonight as well. And I want to thank Chris Miller, as uh, Ken did, for the article in the paper, front page. We're pretty important, aren't we, Ken? <laughs> so, and Ken, I want to congratulate you on the, being inducted as well. It's been a, an exciting night, and I appreciate it, all of you being here and the uh, friends and the family, and, uh, as well as other people, too. So thank you again for allowing me to be here tonight. Congratulations, Ronnie.
I guess if it was left up to Ken Hagen and Jim Sheehan, Bob Room, Ron Holtzford, and Francisco Blanco, soccer would have never occurred in Onslow County. <laughs> this evening, we have recognized some of the best that Onslow County has to offer. Let's give all of our Heisman winners, our state champions, special recognitions, and our Hall of Fame inductees another round of applause. <laughs> if you know of anyone who should be inducted in the Jasper Oslo Sports Hall of Fame next year or any future years, please nominate them. That's how the process gets started. The deadline to nominate someone is December 31st. And if you know any incoming seniors, please direct them to the Wendy's Heisman website. Their deadline to put in their applications is in October. August 1st, excuse me, August 1st. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone for attending this evening's festivities. It's been a great night, recognize a lot of great people, and I can only wish each and every one of you the best. Have a safe evening and drive home safely. Thank you so much.